everyone. Um, our panel is about health IT and social determinants of health. And to my left is uh, Carol Stern. She's the CEO of the US Fund for UNICEF. And moving on down the line to her left, uh, we have Ryan Bosch, who's the president of uh, Startup Socially Determined. Sam Taylor, product manager of Ecovia and Jay Komarneni, who's um, the founder, I guess, of the Human Diagnostics Project. Diagnosis. Diagnosis, not diagnostics, sorry about that. Um, so everybody up here um, is doing work on uh, using tech to help poor people in the United States and around the world, as well as the agencies that serve them. And uh, fundamental to this kind of work is seeing the role of social determinants in health and using data to help bring the two together. Um, this might be a homeless woman who needs stable housing and a decent place to shop so she can get her diabetes under control or helping a large Medicaid agency identify people who are using emergency rooms uh, for their health care when they would be better served and um, cost the system less money if they were somewhere, uh, if they were attending to problems that are leading them there um, more frequently. And um, and then, you know, so so the, the, we have a range of, um, of uh, panelists here. Um, three of, uh, of uh, on our, to my left are really um, startup, startup companies. And I'm gonna start though with Carol, who's with a very well-established organization, has about, what, 20,000 people? 12,000. Um, so Carol, UNICEF is putting tech in the hands of kids to find out their problems and to help them help each other. So can you start off by explaining you report and kids, is it kids power? Kid power. To, uh, kid power. Sure, you know, we understand the significance of data, not only in our decision making, but obviously in our resource allocation. And one of the things we've often struggled with is what kids are thinking, what kids are receiving is not being reported by the kids themselves, but is being reported by the adults who surround them. And so in Uganda, we started piloting a program called You Report, which is a basic SMS text program that kids can opt into that be, has become a polling system. And in Uganda, it grew to about a million kids, but today it's over three million kids around the world. And in particular, we have used it we are using it now in Houston as part of the response to the natural disaster in the follow-up of determining where we're going to put trauma centers. You know, oftentimes when there's some kind of a disaster and the kids leave a community, you don't know then which schools to reopen because you don't know where they've gone to. And this was a first iteration was to just allow us to have a sense of where are these children, what are the services they need, but the reporting also allows us to get what they're thinking that they may not be able to say or be comfortable saying in a more formal setting. So in Uganda, they've actually impacted laws. Um, Google has done the logarithms for us to allow us to capture real-time data, and we're really sitting on one of the largest databases currently of what kids around the world are thinking. But simultaneous to that, the other way we use tech with children is a program called Kid Power. One in four children around the world is severely malnourished. It was a crisis that we struggle with. How will we get food into the mouths of these children? Well, one in four American children has been labeled underactive, contributing to heart disease, contributing to obesity, first generation whose lifespan is less likely to exceed their parents. And we were also dealing with how do we confront that crisis right here and our innovation team at UNICEF USA actually came together and created a program called Kid Power. And at the heart of it, we determined that we could create a low cost fitness band, put it on the arms of kids, many of whom are on food assistance themselves, and challenge them to get active. And for every 2,500 points they would, steps they would take, they'd earn a point, and we wanted this band to do something so that it would celebrate that point and then for every 10 points they would earn, our underwriters would release a sachet of ready-to-use therapeutic food to a starving child. So you're using altruism as a gamification of altruism. Gamification and altruism. Today we have 
Um, last year, the kids saved over 70,000 lives around the world. And today, we have over 300,000 kids currently participating in the program here. I'm curious, how did you how did you reach out to kids, like let's say in Houston after the storm? I mean, how did you find them? How did you, I mean, how did you? So UNICEF works on the ground in partnerships with the local NGOs, and we literally yeah, went through local entities to reach young people. Do you have any idea what percentage of the I don't know the percentage in, in Houston. I don't know that off the top of my head. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, Ryan, the name of your company, Socially Determined, um, you know, reflects this idea that a person's zip code is probably more determinative than their, to their health and their genetic code. Um, so how do you, tell us a little bit about what your company is trying to do and how you activate people to improve behaviors that can lead to better health. Absolutely, thank you, Arthur. So I, I don't think it goes as a bold statement to say our healthcare system is fundamentally broken. I'm an internal medicine physician, and if we want smart cities, we need to go back to understanding the social determinants of health. And we've all heard the adage that Arthur just quoted, that your zip code is much more determinative to your outcome, healthcare spend, and healthcare quality than your genetic code. So again, I'd love to sit and talk about precision medicine and accountable care and meaningful health, but it has to do with the social determinants of health. Uh, my company is an analytic company, technology first, around the social determinants of health. And much like what Carol was just speaking about, uh, altruism or philanthropy is not a sustaining business model. So how do we look at value-based care, the inflection point that's out there right now in our cities where we're not uh, able to continue the fee-for-service reimbursement model, the model that allows any single entity with the entire healthcare paradigm to charge for each event as a single episode, but rather let's transition to a value-based model where we have a full video, the full motion picture. Uh, for the younger folks in the room, the Vine rather than the Instagram, right? It's the whole motion picture of care and how much we're going to charge for it. So our company, Socially Determined, looks at the data from multiple different sources. These are data from claims, from the electronic health records, from publicly available data sets. I won't go into all that right now, but we take that data and we risk stratify that data according to the social determinants of health. Not what Ryan thinks or what my company thinks or what a bunch of doctors think, but what the Institute of Medicine has put in place as the seven pillars that actually impact care. Things like economic well-being, things like access to food, transportation and housing, things like your cultural competence, your social isolation or lack thereof, these actually truly impact your outcome. And whether you have diabetes or heart disease or asthma is important, but not as important as whether you have three hots and a cot. Sorry, I was in the military, so I use that one as well. So most notably, our company is striving to use that data around the social determinants of health to risk stratify individual groups. And you might say, well, who do we serve? We serve cities. We serve Medicaid plans, we serve accountable care organizations, we serve anybody that has a budget as an entity that is responsible for the individual health of persons. So most of our customers are Medicaid plans, disrupt plans, plans where they have responsibility for the dollars of every one of those individuals, but don't know how to smartly spend those dollars. So that's what we're after and that's what we're trying to do. We're excited about it. Um. I'd like to ask you to follow up on that. Um, how do you study sort of what kind of interventions or, or what kind of data um, I mean, has measurable impact on the things that are important to, the, to your clients? Very, very important. <laughs> Obviously, most of our clients that we're working with across New York and Cleveland and uh, Toledo have existing programs. Most of these are $50,000 or less budget items and they are doing some type of health literacy education or cultural support or they're providing vouchers for housing or they're providing vouchers for transportation but they're delivered universally and that's okay right how could you not give to anyone that walked through the door the, the concept though is Arthur how do you measure that and many of the entities have started to measure it but the problem is they don't have a good source of the data both before and after so how do we get to a per member per month cost that would allow a health system like Metro Health in Cleveland where we're working to actually invest in heaters or invest in legal support? That's very non-clinical. That's not medical. That's not reimbursable in traditional healthcare. 
but it actually saves uh, readmission risk for individuals because those kids with asthma aren't going to go into the ER three or four times in that winter time if they can be provided a heater. So again, your point's spot on, and I have to be honest that the measurement for this type of work is nascent, right. but we're trying to get that set up. Are you trying up. to do any research in, in, in association with what you're doing to see if you provide you know, heaters to kids with <laughs> whose families have, you know, to the families of kids who have asthma that there are X number of fewer exacerbations or whatever the measurement is? The good news is that research has been done, uh, and uh, Cincinnati okay. Children's has put a lot of research into the academic side uh, particularly reducing the risk of readmissions with one single intervention arm, and that was legal aid to assure that when that patient got discharged home that they had a roof over their head for the next few months. And when you have a roof over your head, you tend to go get your refills, you tend to get your spacers, you tend to make your follow-up appointments. Uh, so the good news is uh, Cook's Children in, in Texas is also doing a lot of this research. Uh, Case Western in Cleveland, most of the research is anecdotal to retrospective, um, not yet prospective studies, and most of it is around single interventions. Right here nearby, Northwell has done excellent work in housing, recognizing that homelessness is one of the biggest impacts on spend and outcome. And if you provide housing, you imagine that a health system providing housing right near their emergency room will actually reduce recurrent visits. Um, so the measurement is starting, you're, you're right on the right spot, and we're learning as well. Sam, um, your company, as I understand it, provides software for care coordination. Um, so how do you bring together health data with social, with information about social determinants? And, and, and give us an example. I just wonder if you could talk about how the city of Houston is using your technology. As a, oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, so this is cities talking about smart cities. Since that's mentioned. Yeah, so a lot of ways we bring that data together is trying to establish a comprehensive healthcare record that brings in both the social determinants and healthcare data. Um, there's some interoperability standards, so standards that allow you to exchange health data, um, exchange health data um, efficiently and bring data from hospitals, bring data from social service organizations all into a single system, so that when you're looking at a care plan for an individual, it's comprehensive. It addresses, addresses the social determinants, uh, like Ryan was mentioning, it addresses things like housing in that care plan, so that individuals who might have multiple conditions also have as part of that equation for what kind of care planning is done, anything that they're missing in terms of housing, income, and other things with a, a comprehensive view. Thank you. Um, Jay, you, um, your company has, in some ways, it's a little bit more, approaches a little more uh, tech. The, the, the link between the, the tech and the social determinants is a little less obvious. So why don't you just tell us about your company, which is doing some really interesting stuff. Yeah, happy to. Actually, we're structured as a partnership of the social, public, and private sectors. So not a company, but a Exactly. Whatever, so a nonprofit and public benefit corporation whose partners now include the AMA, the AAMC, the American Board of Medical Specialties, and a lot of the other leading US medical organizations. Uh, and soon, hopefully, some of the global ones as well. Um, so the goal of the Human Diagnosis Project is to build an open intelligence system that maps the steps to help any patient. So if you're all familiar with Wikipedia, which is an open encyclopedia, or Linux, an open operating system, we're trying to do something very similar with building an open medical intelligence system. Now this is obviously tremendously important to cities and governments around the world because today medical intelligence is being built by private companies who can ultimately not necessarily be checked in the work that they're doing. By building an open system that anyone can access and contribute to and develop, we actually believe that that's the right way to build a system of healthcare for the future. Now, with respect to where we are today, I think we're actually quite a bit bigger than perhaps uh, our name might suggest in that uh, we're now the largest open medical knowledge project in the world, about 10,000 physicians from 80 countries have contributed to building the system in a collaborative way, very similar to the way that Linux has been built by 14,000 software engineers over a period of 25 years. And our system in the first three plus years of the development uh, is now kind of moving towards this very interesting set of results which can unlock value for stakeholders all over the world. So as a simple example, one of the major applications of the system today is actually an understanding 
whether or not data and whether or not the outcome of a clinical decision was actually good or bad. So what's crazy is if you think about the information that we're collecting in public health today or even in electronic medical records or really any other system, we have no clue if it's right. So think about the fact that when you go to a doctor, they put information in the system and we have no idea whether or not they were right or wrong in that given set of information. Uh, why that's so fascinating as a problem is we're now using that same information right. to learn. Well, and if we don't know if it's right, that's extremely difficult. Which is the well-known garbage in, garbage out problem. And I, one thing that people have asked, I, right now we've just started this week with NIH started this All of Us project, which is aims to enroll a million people, maybe get a lot of their genomes, but also rely quite heavily on their electronic health records. Um, and that's a big question, right? Um, when you were talking earlier about, when you started off, you were talking about not wanting, or, or there being a difference between this being an open source of information versus people owning the data. Um, are you talking about companies that are doing what you're doing? Is that what you're comparing yourself to, say, the IBM Watsons or, I don't know, Optum or companies that are that are kind of doing something similar in that they're taking vast amount of data and trying to crunch it into usable, something that's like usable in a, to a clinician? And Yeah, I think if you have IBM Watson or DeepMind or other technologies, those are fantastic and we're sure they're going to have tremendous impact on society. The problem is that someone need to, needs to watch the watchman, so to speak, and there needs to be a way of knowing whether or not those companies are moving and operating in the best intent of all people, not just people who can afford what, potentially what you, to pay for their technologies. Oh, okay. So you're worried about them hoarding the data, in other words? Uh, not just hoarding the data, but really using intermediating access to such intelligence mm -hmm. solely for the purpose of profit, as opposed to the purpose of social impact, which is really even more crucial with medical intelligence than it was with building an open encyclopedia or an open operating system. If the access to healthcare that can ultimately be significantly better is solely controlled and intermediated just by private interests, that is, that is ultimately a concern for society. Carol, did you, you look like... No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it is the democratization of medicine. I mean, that's really what you're talking about here. It's at the core values of what, what we're all about. I wanted to ask all of you, anybody feel free to jump in and also feel free to jump on each other if you're, somebody says something that you have a response to. Um, you know, right now we're looking at a period where there's maybe some, there's some cuts in store in Medicaid, food stamps, housing. Um, I just... I'm always have the, the question that's always occurring to me is that you know politi politics with a big P and policy, you know, has a big impact uh, on all of the social determinants. Um, so when you're operating in a, uh, how I guess my question is sort of how how far can tech take us in addressing you know, um, I guess scarcity is ultimately what we're talking about. So I'll chime in that since uh, food scarcity, housing scarcity, uh, health literacy are all big social determinant factors, I, I think you make an excellent point. I would contend, and experts that have taught me would contend, that we clearly have a distribution problem um, on the sort of supply-demand curve and a utilization problem, and that the only way to become fiscally sound is to start working on that distribution problem. And so I understand that there will be reductions in SNAP programs and reduction in housing subsidies, but we are not using them in smart ways right now to mm -hmm. target and match, and they are redundantly delivered. So I think we are going to be forced, whether we like it or not, to go to a value-based paradigm around healthcare and other things uh, that will allow us to combat that distribution problem. But I guess the question I have is, if health healthcare, in a way, what, when we talk about social determinants of health, we're saying we're talking about how healthcare should be jumping in to take care of these problems that, in a lot of countries in the world, are taken care of by a, a different kind of social net network or you know social service network. Um, and is that reasonable? Um, you know, and and obviously tech. We hope that tech is going to help us do this, but is it going to be like a cat chasing its tail where you just can never catch up if? 
I think that's an excellent point. There may be other opinions. I'll just throw one out there, and that is just that you can't not do it financially, right? Okay. You can't not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I hear the point, and yes, other European nations, particularly the Nordic nations, have always been very involved in the social aspects of their society. And if you add the social impact, they've reduced health care costs by putting the money in the social side. Mm -hmm. And so I think right. we can take a lesson from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think health care is a lot like other problems that have emerged in our world. So for example, the fact that there's a billion people who are uh, malnourished or hungry or can't get food and a billion people are obese, et cetera. I mean, it's an allocation and distribution problem. And the, really the way to solve access problems is first to solve cost problems and to solve cost problems and really the utilization of unnecessary services and other things which drive up cost. To reallocate those effectively, you need to actually understand clinical quality. And that's really kind of what the system that we built helps do in that um, we can now combine the input of multiple physicians with machine intelligence to produce results you know, better than 95% of individual physicians. So that actually serves a really powerful way of understanding clinical quality and validity, which leads to cost reduction, which le leads to access improvements. But I don't think it's just allocation and distribution. You know, it, it is agree. also, and I think it's where tech really plays the biggest role, it's the education factor. It's yeah. the understanding because in many communities where there's food scarcity, there's still obesity. Yeah. So it's Agreed. not just allocation and distribution. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to imply that, but I think that's a great clarification. The one, the one, the one other kind of point that I'd add there is, is really when you think about access to care um, globally, there's 3.5 billion people on the planet who don't have access to essential health services, which was a recent World Bank number. So it's basically half the world. Um, and there's really only a couple major ways to solve that problem. There's to train more health workers. There's a significant shortage of health workers globally. There's to equip health workers to do more with less. So that's also where we think AI can play a role. So you can up-level a community health worker and make them do some of the things a nurse can do and up-level a, a nurse and make them be able to do some of the things a doctor can do and so on and so forth. Um, and then the third is to actually better incense the right types of care. So the problem internationally is that you have health workers who don't show up for work um, because they have no incentive to do so. And then the problem in the US is you have people who are billing for things that aren't necessary. So you have this misaligned incentives problem. And the reason you have that is there's no check or no understanding of whether or not something should or shouldn't be done in a given situation. Um. I, there's a lot of talk in, in, you know, Politico, we cover policy and politics um, for, for better, for worse, mostly for better, I think. Um, but um, there, you know, one, one interesting sort of point of continuity between the Obama administration and the Trump administration is um, the people at HHS are still talking about value-based care. And um, so I guess, but, but there is, there has been some to a degree, there's a uh, perhaps, you know, not surprising, taking the foot off of regulation a little bit. Um, and what I was curious about is w when you look at um, issues around continuity of care and improving, you know, uh, networking of sort of information in different areas of, of social social welfare. Um, do you think that? the federal government is doing about the right amount now or should we be should should there be you know tighter rules saying uh, you know they're like on uh, information blocking like you know that need they need to put their foot down and do this or is it just a matter of putting the incentives in place and then it'll happen on its own you know I think one area where there could be a lot more incentives and better use of incentives is health information exchanges Mm -hmm. So money to fund information exchanges in communities. Um, if you don't have normally called an HIE in a community, data sharing becomes extremely expensive and really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. So any federal support, and there is some, but definitely not enough to mm -hmm. help build those in communities would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think one thing that would help a lot is on one end, as we just discussed in the US, to use this specific example, yeah. uh, we have on one side service providers providing services that are needed, so trying to bill for as much as possible, even when it doesn't help you, and it doesn't um, actually, it, it, in some ways it can actually hurt you, both financially and, and physically. Um, and then on the other side, you have 
um, payers for care trying to deny things that you may need. So you have this completely misaligned problem where one group is trying to deny as much as possible and the other group is trying to approve as much as possible or get approved as much as possible. And really what's missing is kind of some sort of intermediation or mediation between what should actually be done. The way that that intermediation is being done today is through legacy systems that use um, literally ICD codes, so International Classification mm -hmm. of Disease Codes, which are archaic uh, manual rules for deciding whether or not you should get approved for some sort of care. Now imagine if instead of that, it was a process of actually validating clinical quality and validity independently um, by any variety of systems. Um, that would actually be significantly better to have that sort of intermediary in the same way that when you go get a cab, you have an intermediating platform which is Lyft or Uber, or you go and stay in someone's apartment for rental. Uh, you know, there's, you're convinced that this person's probably trustworthy enough that you should think about doing that. So I, I hear what you're saying, Jay, and uh, I would just offer some context around this sort of distribution strategy or disruption, I should say, strategy. And, and bottom line is that this uh, grandstanding or, or water cooler talk about information blocking, it's less so about ICD-9s or DRGs or CPTs or RX codes or any other code I can go on with. and more about the fact that we want to grandstand and say people are blocking. You know, when someone speaks French and someone speaks Spanish, and yeah, they're both Romance languages, but they, they can't communicate. So is one of them, when they speak French in front of the other one, are they information blocking? No, that's just the way they were raised. We've got a bunch of huge giants, think the aerospace injury, huge giants like Epic and Cerner and Siemens and GE dominating the healthcare marketplace with their electronic health records. It's not their fault that they built them on a proprietary platform, that they didn't use ICD norms or codes or HICFA or SNOMED, and then they're not really information blocking, there's just not someone who's paid to do that translation. Well, partly because the hospital systems are happy to keep their customers and don't want them going out of network, right? Sure, but the hospital systems just license it off the shelf. So uh -huh. back to the point of politics using their arm, which we need. Think of High Tech Act, think of the transitions mm -hmm. over the past decade that have created a situation where now we have almost 85% of all providers doing order entry digitally. So when I started as a doctor 20 years ago, it was writing on a piece of paper, okay? A piece of paper can't check penicillin allergies, right? We still do common things poorly. So at least now, 80% of people, when they put in prescription for penicillin, no matter where they are, doc, nurse, a nurse practitioner, pharmacist, whether they're on Cerner, Epic, EMDs, Athena, you name it, it gets checked against the allergies. It has to. It happens. That's progress, and that's mm -hmm. because of that effort that was spent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, the negative part is rather than just incent progress and put uh, compliance and requirements out there, We've made it so, so, so hard on your average one and two doc shop. Mm -hmm. They can't keep up with last year's MIPS, this year's meaningful use, last year's uh, accelerated performance plan, alternative payment model. Sure. They can't keep up. Right. And so I think the incentives are the right place, but they're way too complex. Yeah. It's always a question of um, how do you keep pushing things forward but without making it too complicated? And, and also this question of consolidation resulting from burnout and, and, and also just the need of administrative people to take care of all this paperwork, or it's electronic paperwork, it's still paperwork, I guess. Um, let's see, I think we Can have- Can I chime in one more thing? Yes, please. I think it's just real important that we all recognize we have a healthcare system that is receipt focused. It is a massive billing system globally connected to generate a receipt. Until we fundamentally disrupt that with technology like Jay speaking of or Sam or Carol, we're not gonna get anywhere. It is a fundamental system that generates a receipt and that's why we are challenged. Mm -hmm. um, anybody, do we have any questions from the audience? I'll just Thank you very much, Ed. and I came in late, so I don't know if you talked about infectious disease control at all, but I was evaluating the recent West Africa Ebola outbreak and worked in AIDS for 30 years, and 
I'm hoping technology can help health infrastructure around the world. And what we saw with Ebola and Zika and everything is that we're all a global community and every city to city in a proactive way could help stop these growing uh, epidemics. And I'm hoping that technology can help that happen for the people where it often, uh, out the outbreaks occur in developing countries, but also in localizing, controlling before it spreads wider and its cities and its transport and its technology, I'm hopeful of. I can tell you that for UNICEF, one of the ways we were tracking and responding to infectious diseases is using social media. Just really looking at, and we were able to get from Facebook, but anonymously, geographic distribution of the chatter to figure out who was talking about what and where it was. So that's one way in which we've been able to, you know, at least put the services where they are most needed. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that point. I mean, this is actually why we need an open medical intelligence type of system because basically there's all of these different stakeholders, there's all of these silos of information. There's often a good reason not to share that information, but there's a great way to share the intelligence generated from the, inf from the information itself. So there's a lot of kind of interesting and advanced techniques that are emerging in computer science like differential privacy. This is why um, with your iPhone, for example, uh, I, the Apple can actually learn from the data on your phone without actually exposing that data to third parties. And so I think we can do some really exciting stuff by taking information in different silos that it currently exists in, and that's the only way we're gonna get to predictive disease surveillance, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of crazy to think that basically today, the largest existential threat to society is completely unchecked. We have no immune system and that is actually pandemic disease because you know Ebola kills people too fast and HIV AIDS kills people too slow but if there's a disease on that curve that sits right in the middle uh, you know a large swath of society is is gonna go away very quickly that would be diabetes well no I, I mean I'm actually referring to pandemic disease actually uh, wiping out civilization like in a short time frame so I'm, I'm not talking about um, what, what is potentially the largest cost in, in, to society today, which I completely agree with, agree with you, but I'm talking about literally the survival of the human species. But is part of your open system um, getting information out that somebody who isn't a specialist, who's in, in uh, you know, uh, where were the countries, I guess it was um, Sierra Leone and, and so on, getting that information on how to deal with the, like quarantining Ebola out really fast and efficiently and in language that can be understood. Or just being able to do diagnostics in a way that you may not have the training to do it yourself, but to access. You know, I think one of the more interesting innovations I've seen technology recently is a company that's been able to take sonogram technology and take it down to a chip that can be embedded in a cell phone. So it takes what was before a $100,000 sonogram machine and puts it into a cell phone and it allows you to do, there's a program for doctors and a program for dummies, and I played with the dummy one and was doing heart sonograms in my office. I mean, it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Now, it's not, I can't diagnose what I'm seeing, but I'm able to create the imaging to the level where it could go to some place where that, that diagnosis could be read. Yeah, yeah, and I think the other thing that perhaps we're missing is that these systems can actually be accessed directly by machines themselves, right? So in, for example, in predictive disease surveillance, it may not be humans in the loop who are kind of making decisions about such, such, such components, but if you notice that there's an outbreak in a given region, then you can alert people in that region that this is spreading in these patterns in this way, such that public health can step in and actually do much better than what they can do today where we're literally flying blind in public health despite the data that we have. Uh, I'm curious, especially with the expansion of like technology-based information of medical processing, uh, is there anything lost in the doctor to patient interaction there where is, is trust enhanced by that system or, or more, are people more distrusting of that analysis or diagnosis? I mean, it d depends on getting the right information to people who, at the right time and so on, but please go. So healthcare is still human. It's still behavioral. 
And I have a great slide deck that uh, has the first three slides that is thematically what you just said about the break and the fracture between the doctor-patient relationship. And it leads the entire audience to thinking that it's going to be technology, the electronic health record, the doc leaning into the computer. Um, and then I show the dates of the quotes, and it's from the early 1900s, and it's actually the stethoscope. So the stethoscope was thought to be a come-between. It doesn't allow me to lay my hands on my patient, but now I'm putting something in between. So I think as in anything human and important, it's all how you frame it. Yeah, my, my view on your question is as technology gets better, it gets more out of the way. So for example, as we get natural language processing and speech to text and computer vision, the patient and the physician relationship becomes closer because the physician isn't standing over their computer typing everything in. Basically, as the systems get better at encoding and structuring and organizing information automatically, you can actually focus much more on that intimate relationship. But, but there's always new technology, right? There's always 2.0. I mean, in my, I'm just, I mean, I hear doctors complaining all the time about their EHRs, and we're all, and at the same time, part of what brings us together is, I mean, there are some doctors who obviously, and there's a lot of benefit from them, but yet I think it's a real, a real issue that the technology isn't working for people. The commute, the, the decision support that's, that, that obviously is a positive value that it can help a doctor figure something out better, but if you get bombarded with them, they're just useless. And I think everyone who uses a computer, they've obviously gotten a lot better. And yet, you know, when they roll out a new system, it takes a while and everybody's very frustrated. Um, and I, I think with medicine, it's a little sensitive, right? Because it's not just that you have to run back to the help desk as you do in my office and say, what the, what the heck is going on? I just lost a screen full of story I wrote. You know, it's more life and death. Yeah, although you can make an argument that as uh, sensors and computers uh, get better, uh, you can actually select medical professionals more on the things that humans are uniquely good at doing, right? So if I can create a sensor which can recognize certain characteristics of your health status better than the human eye can, as an example, or I can do so in a way that helps compute the right path of care in a very effective way, uh, that facilitates and, and empowers a physician to do a better job, I actually can move more and more of the function towards caretaking and caregiving and really preserving and enhancing that human relationship. I don't want to get too philosophical. I've made a career, obviously, off of physician change management. Um, <laughs> but it, it's not just healthcare. It's not just technology. It, it's the fact that you have to adapt to change. We can all complain about our phones, we can complain about the weather, we can complain about whatever form the government requires for taxes this year. So I, I think the transition around physicians and using technology um, is, again, not going to change. It's how you manage that change. Um, let me ask one other question about, since this is smart cities, um, I've heard of a number of places around the country that are you know, doing some of these ex I mean, they're really still kind of experiments. Um, do you think that this is something, I mean, if you're, I don't know, let's hope that somebody out here is, that this is useful information in thinking about running their city or helping to run their city. Are there ways that, um, you know, that cities should be thinking about just as a basic, you know, kind of introductory type of technical approach toward dealing with, their health problems. I mean, do, I don't know if any of your companies think, or companies or NGOs or think that you have the answer to that, or is it just, should there be a department in every city health department, a, a chief technology officer who's thinking about these things? What? I think from the UNICEF perspective it is, we know in this country our kids are plugged in. So to do anything that isn't inclusive of that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. You know, when we created Kid Power, we could have introduced it as a means of a teacher getting a kid to get active. You know, all of the research showed us the kids who have the altruism factor 55% more active than the kids who aren't presented with an altruistic opportunity. So we knew that the proposition worked, but in order to engage the young person to want to take advantage of it, it had to be fun, it had to be gamified, it had to be online. 
So for a city to be smart, uh, the city needs to be healthy. And uh, to be healthy, you have productive citizens. Uh, the focus on the city health departments and their ability to put budget and resources into social determinants and healthcare outcomes has to be guided by risk stratification. I think that's the premise of our company and, and what we're advocating. And so within small cities to understand where the allocation on housing, food, and transportation, where it is, making sure that it's effective and that it's targeted and not done in a blind manner. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, social determinants, focusing, focusing on housing is a good place to start. The data on housing is really, really good that that's a social determinant that affects health outcomes and reduces costs in a system. And bringing together housing providers and local hospitals, local emergency rooms, even fire department and other emergency services to at least start the conversation and then start about what kind of technology will bridge those gaps is a great place to start. Yeah, and I think lastly, it's just the number of different types of information that actually affect public health is so vast, right? It's, it's some of the examples that, that uh, these folks have pointed out, but also things like, you know, how the city itself is structured, how it's designed, you know, how much ground floor retail there is, how green it is. All of these things need to be coming into the smart design of cities, but ultimately affect health and well-being in a very powerful way. And I think one of the biggest opportunities for doing so still requires that we actually are not uh, kind of facing this garbage in, garbage out problem. We really need to look at what types of information we're using as well as how do we check the validity of that information. Great, well listen, um, I'm sure we could discuss all of this all day. Um, Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Uh, it's been a really interesting discussion, and I'm sure that the members of the panel will be happy to talk with the audience after we're done. So thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.